So thank you for coming. Uh, so this session will be about accelerating silicon design with uh, Jupyter Notebooks and open source uh, PDKs. So it's going to be an interactive session. I'm going to explain uh, briefly what it is about, and I'm going to do a live demo. There are going to be a link on the screen. If you want to open that link and follow the demo by yourself, uh, you will be able to do so. So feel free to open your computer and follow uh, if you want to follow along. So first, my name is Johan Ofrosin. Uh, uh, I go online by Propy. I've been at Google for now 10 years, and uh, I'm a developer relation engineer. So I'm working mostly on developer-facing uh, uh, product and trying to make the experience better uh, for external developer. And recently, I joined like uh, the hardware tool chain and focusing on enabling people to do custom silicon. So this is like, the hardware world is new to me. Uh, I didn't really know about custom silicon before joining that team. So I approach this with like uh, the software engineering mindset. So my team mission at Google is to make custom silicon easier to build for everyone at scale, just like software. So we really want um, team at Google and team outside of Google to be able to think of designing their software and their hardware and their silicon at the same time. So that like you could build a fully accelerated experience and build exactly the chip that your application needs. Like the vision is a bit like this. Like imagine that if you are a software developer, you have the dash O flag to, that you can pass to your compiler to decide what level of optimization you want. And imagine if there was like a flag that allowed you to pass like silicon. Like you should, you could like generate an hardware that optimize your algorithm, like and generate the hardware description for optimizing like your processing. So that's a bit, it doesn't exist yet, but that's a little bit of where we want to go, like the vision. And uh, my team, like uh, two years ago, uh, released like a paper at um, ICAD, ICCAD uh, 2020, uh, that was about the missing pieces of open design uh, enablement. And there is also a version of that paper in Japanese uh, on this website, so on developers.google.com slash silicon slash research. And basically it came out with the following, uh, assumption is that in the current like hardware design world in order to enable like uh, this vision of co-designing software and hardware at the same time and having like software engineer that can like build custom silicon there are missing pieces and those four missing pieces are first like an option to have open source pdk like currently like when people wants to manufacture custom silicon they need to sign an nda with the foundry so uh, it's not like some API that you can look up on the internet like we do in software all the time. Like it's, you literally need to do a contract with a foundry to be able to access the specification. Like most of the tooling that allow people to manufacture silicon or to design like custom silicon is proprietary. Um, it's not necessarily a problem that it's proprietary, but it does like uh, um, handicap like people, um, uh, the capability of running this software wherever they want. Like if they want to run it on their laptop, uh, usually they need to use a license from their uh, work, so they won't be able to run it on their, custom, uh, on their personal laptop. If they want to use it as a university on like various computer lab at the university, usually it's restricted to like a, a single computer there. And even more, like if they want to run it on the cloud on thousands of VM, like they won't be able to do that with uh, uh, a, work a workstation workshop, so a workstation license. So like um, having an op open source like silicon toolchain option allow really people to get started wherever they want. They can get started on their laptop, on the cloud, like on computer at their university. They can like get started with those tools uh, freely without constraint. And the other thing that we uh, identify is that there are missing open source IP block and, and generator. Like often like the, the block that comes uh, with a PDK, uh, often come like with the tool, uh, the proprietary tool that, uh, that come with it. And so you really, if you go out, if you use a different tool, or if you want to use a different PDK, there is not a, a, a real way to repurpose like this IP to different technology. And so like, uh, well, like in the software world, it doesn't work like this. We have a lot of library that can get ported across a, vari uh, a variety of environments. And so we can f freely reuse like some open source block and build like bigger pieces out of that. And so like the idea is that like if we want, um, an op if you want like software engineer to be able to succeed, uh, into designing custom silicon, there needs to be design blocks that they can reuse freely. And the last thing is like cheaper and faster manufacturing option. Like when you want to manufacture custom silicon, it takes like a month uh, and uh, multiple months like to get the silicon back. 
and it often costs like uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars to manufacture like a single chip. And so like it's not accessible to like uh, a hobbyist or a student. Like they often need like to have like some kind of arrangement with their university, university to be able to do their first step out. So we want also to democratize that, like make it so that it's easy for anyone to get started and manufacture uh, custom silicon. And so we think that if we have those four pieces, there will be like an open source silicon ecosystem, similar to what we have like for software, where like uh, people that don't know anything about design and people that know a lot about design will be able to collaborate and build things together. And so like that's uh, what Google uh, decided to try to fix, like to fix like those missing pieces. And the thing that we started working on is open source PDKs. So we um, worked with a foundry called Skywaller in the US, uh, called Skywaller Technology, and we managed to convince them to open source their uh, 130 nanometer uh, PDK. So it's a very old technology. It's more than 15, uh, 15 year old, but it's a fully open source on GitHub under Apache 2 licenses, meaning that anybody is able to look at the PDK, study its content, look how the standard cells are implemented, and come up and use it to build their own design. So, and they don't have to sign any NDA or even to talk to Skywater in order to do that. They can get started right away like they do with any like open source software project. There is also a different variant of that PDK, the Sky, Sky 130B variant, which is very interesting because it has support for RIRAM. So it's like a, a kind of advanced or like research, uh, um, uh, a research uh, 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 a functionality that's very active in research right now that's available on this older node PDK. Uh, more recently, we also partner with a new foundry called Global Foundry, and uh, we managed to convince them similarly to open source our 180 nanometer PDK. And so similarly, it's open on, it's uh, available on GitHub, freely for anybody to use under the page 2 licenses. And we also like uh, partner further with uh, Skywater Technology for um, them to open source their 19 nanometer PDK uh, next year. And so today, during um, this little tutorial, I will show you how to use like the Skywater A PDK to produce like a very simple design. And so the tool chain that we're going to use is all based on open source tool, and it's based on those tools uh, that I want to introduce briefly to you. So first, there is like uh, an high level synthesis toolkit called XLS that's actually developed by Google, by uh, half of my team, uh, that the team I'm part of at Google. The idea is that you write like your description into a high level language, so either uh, a syntax that's close to Rust or C++, and then it can uh, generate and pipeline your code for you and generate the hardware description for it. Then we're gonna use like for synthesis, like the thing that map uh, or hardware design to the technology, we're gonna use Yosis, which is a very, uh, very uh, well-known tool inside the open source hardware community that's, that's used also a lot for uh, people that do uh, FPGA design. Then for the plus and root tool, so the thing that turn like our technology map design into an actual layout, we're gonna use uh, um, a project called Open Road. So it's going to do the floor planning, the placement, and the routing for design. And we are going to orchestrate that tool with a flow called Open Lane. And um, last, when we get like our chip layout done, we need to create a file to be able to send it to the foundry for manufacturing. And for that, we are going to use two tools like Magic and KLayout, which are uh, layout tools that are used uh, to um, perform the last round of check on our layout and make sure we can generate a GDS file that's, uh, that's um, that's comply with the foundry specification. So from this, we are going to go basically from a .x file, which is like a, a file that would look, uh, look like a lot like code, like just regular code that any software engineer could uh, write, and down to an actual GTS file, which is like the actual silicon implementation of that design that could manufacture on, on uh, with um, either Skywater or uh, the Global Foundry PDK. So in order to install those tools, like uh, before we started uh, um, engaging with that community, like all the tools were a little bit all over the place and a lot of those tools have to be built from source. And it could be like a really, um, uh, it could really um, slow adoption when people have to like perform a lot of command inside your program in order to get started. So in order to uh, make that easier, we created like a set of Conda packages for all those two chain elements. So we have package for each of the PDK and also a package for open lane that include like all the dependency of the tool I mentioned there, and a package for XLS, the front end that allows you to do high level synthesis. So if you use like a Conda packaging system and you type this line in your um, terminal, you should be able to get a fully functioning tool chain to go from um, a, a code like a description to actual silicon. 
And like um, the other thing that we found out was really interesting for people to be able to share their design with others is the usage of Jupyter Notebook. So Jupyter Notebook is a very well known like um, um, component that a lot of people use inside the ML or data science field. It's basically an environment into which you can type documentation, commands, and uh, serialize the output of those commands. And so when you share a, uh, a notebook with someone else, he's, open, he's able to see all of that. Like the documentation, the command that you run, the result. And you can also like build some pretty visualization around those results. It's a very useful tool to create reproducible research. And we think that it's also a useful tool to be able to create, to produce reproducible hardware design. Basically, the vision is that if you share like the notebook with someone else, you should be able to run the same tool that you run and be able to get the same result. So I'm going to go now and demo briefly uh, that. And uh, you're free to open that link if you want on your computer. There is also like a short link there that you can open uh, by yourself. And then I'm going to leave you maybe like 30 seconds to open that if you want. And then I'm going to go through the demo. So is that okay? Do you uh, understand what I say? Uh, am I speaking good enough? Thumbs up if it's okay? No? Okay. Okay, so let's go through the demo. So if you click on that link, you should arrive to that page, which is like a GitHub repository that has a lot of different notebooks around like open source silicon. And the one that I want to show you today is like this last one. Um, the one that we used uh, actually for running workshop at uh, Todai and to uh, Koko uh, um, and Tokyo Tech in, um, in, uh, in, ja in Japan here um, as of this month. And so when you open that link here, the opening collab, you should arrive on that page. And if you want to follow it on Japanese, in Japanese, there is actually a Japanese version of the, of the notebook here that you can follow. And you, f you open it in Japanese, um, it should show up like that. And so is that big enough? Maybe I should zoom a little bit. Okay. So, um, when you, so the idea from this notebook is to go from like a code description to actual like silicon. So the first thing that you need to do is to install the tools. So if you click here on install dependency, it should run for maybe two minutes, two or three minutes, and like install all the dependencies that you need to uh, perform that tool. Currently, like the actual content of the thing that installs the dependency is hidden, but if you are curious and you want to look at how it's done, you can click on this open show code button and you should be able to see it. And so it installed like a lot of packages uh, uh, from Conda and then like set up them so that they can be used uh, from within Collab environments. And this environment, Collab, the thing that we are showing here, is an environment that Google has to run notebook uh, on Google infrastructure. So when you click like this cell, this actually run on Google's data center. It doesn't run on your computer. So you don't like mess up with uh, any of your computer system and you can use freely like Google resources to do your research or to do your experimentation. So um, the, the thing that the first part of the flow that we are going to run is this hardware uh, high level synthesis flow. And so the idea is that we start from a description that's either written in C++ or Rust, or a dialect of Rust, like DSLX. This, this is the thing that we are going to use today. And then we go to an intermediate representation. Then there is some optimization pipeline that are going on. And then like uh, this code gets scheduled, uh, depending on the number of pipeline that we, uh, that we ask for. And then we get some Verilog, which is like a, an hardware description language that goes into most of the other EDA tool. The interesting in that, what the thing that makes this uh, hardware synthesis, uh, hardware high level synthesis uh, workflow a little bit unique is that because you write your, um, your description into a regular programming language, you can write tests for it. And just like you, you, you do in software, so you've got a chance to validate like your logic and your design like before actually uh, starting to think about hardware. The other interesting thing is that it has this intermediate representation, which allow like other tool to plug on this intermediate representation, much like a regular like software compiler to chain and perform optimization on it. One of those tools uh, allow you to do uh, a functional simulation uh, uh, using uh, LLVM JIT. Meaning that we can take like the intermediate representations that get generated from your uh, hardware uh, from your hardware high-level description, 
and run them at a native speed on your computer. So, so you don't have to wait to um, go to system Verilog or Verilog and to go those the art, actual like hardware description language to perform some simulation. You can perform like some very quick uh, and native simulation and to, uh, output like um, like some 8x6 64 code for your simulation. And you can also perform like some logical equivalence and some uh, formal testing on the hardware on the intermediate uh, presentation as well. So, which make it like really interesting because you can like pr you can imagine that a lot of different tools could plug onto that ecosystem. The other thing that's a little bit unique is that like usually when you uh, think about design, you have to think about how you want to pipeline your design, how you want your computation to be performed along the clock cycle, and that's usually a pretty uh, invasive uh, decision inside your design. You need to kind of rewrite the very log in order to accumulate more or less pipeline stages. Like here with uh, uh, DSLX, what happens is that this become a tool decision. So you write uh, your hardware script, your, what you're uh, processing in a data flow-like language outside of the pipelining constraint, and then with passing parameter to the tool, you decide which kind of pipeline you want to ingest. So I'm going to show you a little bit of an example of what it looks like. So here we have like kind of the simplest design possible. Um, we have a, a little function that's adding two bits. So it takes two, two arguments, one A and B, that are both like one bit uh, wide. So that's like what the UI, uh, U1 like stand for. And it returns like a two bit output. Because like when we add that two bit, there could be like a, a carry. And so we need like this additional bit to accommodate for that. And we will write like that operation, much like we will write it in software. Uh, we say like uh, the, the output N is equal to A plus B. And when we put this as the last script, uh, as the last uh, expression of this function, which will call like uh, cause like the any invocation to the um, other expression to resolve to that number. And like, um, but that's like kind of a regular function with two parameters. Now we need to map it to a chip, and like for mapping it to a chip, I I declare like another function on top of that, and I decide the number of input and output that my chip will will need. And here I say that I will have like eight IO pin in and eight IO pin out. So that's much more larger than my one bit, one bit adder that I'm doing. So I need to kind of slice those input to fit them inside my function. So here I say, I take the first bit of input and send it to the parameter A. And then I, I take my uh, fourth, fourth bit of input and like um, uh, send it to, to the parameter B. And as like I was saying before, like I can run test for that to verify that it actually works. So I could call like the other function and verify that one plus one equal two. And I could also call like the user module function, like split my bits according to the convention I, sh I chose and verify that I get actually the, the, my result bit here. So if I run like this cell, I can see that the unit tests are passing. So it means that my, uh, at least uh, as it is described currently, my design is functionally correct. And so now I need to convert that into an actual hardware description. So the first step that we do is that like we uh, convert this um, to this intermediate representation, this uh, IR I was mentioning before, which will like uh, be, it will look like this language. So it will use like a series of primitives that describe like the op actual hardware operation I'm, I'm trying to perform. So you see that there is like this add here, there is a bunch of, uh, of uh, bit concatenation and bit slice that are happening. It's a more verbose, but more descriptive, the, the, um, a more explicit uh, description of what I'm trying to do here. And then the last step is to uh, convert that to Verilog. So there is another tool inside the toolchain, access toolchain to do that. And so I can specify um, path to my intermediate representation and get a Verilog file out of it. So here you see it's a little bit silly because uh, the actual Verilog implementation of that is, uh, is very similar to our input, but you can imagine that you could develop that much more complicated design that resulted in much more verbose Verilog description. And so now, once we have that Verilog, we can get it through the open source silicon toolchain. So we want to get that Verilog that describes like what we, the, pro, the, art, the actual hardware that we want to implement in a very high level fashion, like just add two number or add two bit into actual gate that are laid out on our design. So we are going to run a flow that's called open lane. That's comp compromise of, of a lot of different tools that perform all the operations that are necessary to get like this actual GDS file that we can submit to the foundry. So the first thing that we need to uh, pass to open lane is like a, some configuration. 
So we need to basically physically map our design to what it looks like on a chip. So the first thing that we need to say is how big we want our chip to be. So here we are saying that we want uh, our chip to be 50 micron uh, width. And then we need to specify like uh, the target density, how, how much packed uh, we want, uh, the, how much tight we want the, um, the gate to be packed together. Do we want them to be spread all around this 50 micron area, or do we want to get them really, really tight? And the other thing that we need to specify is the path to our uh, Verilog file and the name of our top level module. We also need to specify the clock. Uh, here we don't have any clock because we have a fully conditional design, but if we have a clock, we will specify here and we also specify like the period, like how many, how many last seconds we want uh, this clock to be. The other thing that we need to specify is the pin because our chip is going to have pin and we need to tell the tool where they should be. So you remember we had like eight input and eight output. And so we have this little file that um, allow you to say, I want like the um, IO input to be on the west side. And I want like my output to be on the east side. And that's what like those directives stand for. And once we have those information, we can try to run the, the, the flow. And here I'm gonna write like, I wanna run the step of the flow one by one so that we can see the intermediate result and understand how our high-level description turn into actual silicon. So the first step that we need to perform in C is synthesis. So it will take like our uh, RTL description, like the Verilog that I mentioned before, and it will map it to the technology. So it will understand that uh, I need to perform this add operation and what type of gate I need to f perform on that. And it will output like basically uh, a graph of those gate and those connection between them. And as part of the result of that, uh, of that, uh, of that first step, we can get like an estimate on how many gate our design is using, and we can get also an estimate of the delay, how long it takes to perform like this operation. So once I've written like this, I can like run the preview here. And so you can see it run the flow here, it's done with the synthesis, and here I can see how the design is actually implemented. So you can see that there is two gate, a XOR gate and an end gate. And then there is this little thing at the end that like pack six zero uh, on the eight on the six like most significant bits. So this is like the usual way to implement like an adder function for one bit. Like the least significant bit will be like the XOR of the of the two input of the two bit input, and the most significant bit will be the end of the of the two input. And you can see here like what's interesting is that this IO in here and the out here and the correspond actually to like um, the variable that we used inside the original like code here. So that's like also a nice thing is that like we can map like the connection that are happening between the gate to our original code. And so now like we have like kind of the logical uh, um, description of how our gate are connected together, but we still need to turn that into an actual like chip layer. So the first thing that we do is like we uh, run floor plan. And so it will take this technology ma map netlist and output like a, 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 a die that's corresponding to the size that we are requested for. It will lay out the, la the IO for it, so the input and the output that we requested, and set up the poly power delivery network so that our gate could get connected. And the primary metric that we get out of this is like an estimate of the area that our chip is going to be using. So here the floor plan is completed, and if I run the preview, we can see here that we have like um, our basic like uh, chip. You can see here we have like the eight input and the eight output, and we have like the power the power delivery network uh, that like um, layout in the middle. But you can see that our end gate and our XOR gate are still on the bottom corner here. Uh, here we have our on gate, and here we have our XOR gate. If we take a look at this, we can take a look at how the XOR gate is implemented. And the reason those are still at the bottom is because, like, we didn't run placement yet. We just like did like the floor planning. So that's what we're going to do next. We are going to do the placement step. So it's going to take like this physical uh, layout that we prepared. Like it's going to take like again like our technology map netlist to understand the gate that we need to lay out. And then it will come up with a cell plast like somewhere inside the design. 
And for that, we'll be able to get an estimate of uh, the actual density of our cell, how packed they are together, and also like uh, uh, an estimate of the timing closure. So depending on how far away or get are, this will also affect our timing. So if we run placement, we can regenerate the preview here. So here you can see like we have a little bit a little bit of a more complicated design. If I remove like the two things on top, I can see that like my um, end gate and my XOR gate got laid out like in the middle of my design. So like the tool like decided that this will be the good location for those two gates to be here and provide like satisfied timing and, satis and satisfy like the two the, the density property constraint that I also added. And um, next, I'm going to do, but those um, gates are still not connected together. So that's why we need to perform the routing step. So the routing step will take like this physical layout with the components that are placed and like draw some little wire like between them and connect them to the input and to the output. And like for that, we'll be able to get a much more uh, um, precise uh, uh, prediction of our timing uh, criteria. So if we met like the original frequency that we ask for, but we also be able to know how much conjected is our design, like how close those wires are together. So it takes a little bit more time, but if we rerun the preview here, we see like, um, let me remove that the top layer. So it's a little bit more um, easy to understand. So like here we can see like our input pin. You see like for bit one uh, or bit zero, it goes inside this buffer and goes into the first XOR gate here. We have like our input four. that also go through a buffer and go also in that XOR gate. Here you can see our connection between my XOR gate and my end gate. And uh, like I get like those input routed similarly to my end gate that's here. And then I get them routed here on the bottom to my uh, list, to my two uh, end bits. So like this bit zero and bit one. And so like here you get like kind of a good idea on how like your original design is mapping to gates that are connected to each other. And the last step that we need to perform is sign off. So we're going to perform a series of checks that actually verify that our design could be manufactured. So it will take like the foundry specification and verify like that the spacing between the gate is correct, that the spacing between the wire is correct, that we don't have anything outside of the die and verify more complicated like uh, constraints that are uh, specific to the foundry. We perform like a, a lot of analysis and at the end, we get like a more full like chip that's uh, ready for manufacturing. And usually like when you integrate, uh, I, I wanted also to, to show you that they, 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 they also, you get also get a bunch of metrics that give you like, um, for example, a breakdown of the gate that get used for your device, that give you like um, a count of the wire, um, um, an estimate of the actual wire length of how long uh, of the wire you have across all of the design and some uh, metrics around power and, uh, and uh, timing uh, measurement. And usually uh, when you want to submit that design for manufacturing, you need to include it into like a, a, a harness that the foundry provide you. And uh, I will tell you later that Google uh, provide an option to actually manufacture this design uh, for free. The other thing I wanted to show you is that like that's cool for another and that's a, a nice way to kind of learn those different steps that we can also like do much more complicated thing. And here, like I wanted to show you, for example, that say we design the same chip that has eight input and eight outputs, but instead of doing just adding two bits, we are gonna try to multiply like four bit inputs uh, together to get the eight bit output. So like that will be a mule four uh, function that takes like the four, this first four byte and that like take the, 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 the second uh, four byte and shove them into that function and hopefully implement like a multiplication. And like um, the, 
I can like uh, I think I can write some tests in advance to verify that this is actually what I want to do. So I say that a by h should be equal at 64, and I also verify that it works when I uh, for the higher level function when I pass like all the input into a single 8-bit design. And so if I run that test, it will fail because like my function here is returning zero. It's not actually implementing like uh, the multiplication. If I wanted to implement the multiplication algorithm by myself. Uh, that with only the primitive that I have, that will be also like difficult. But the nice thing with an, an high level synthesis language is that you often come with a standard library, a standard library of function that you can use right away. And so if I look at the um, standard library for XLS and I search for multiplication, I see here that there is like actually two multiplication fu function, like a, an inside multiplication and a side multiplication function that I can use right away. So I, could, I can go back inside my code and do here um, call like the std uh, umul function and pass my two inputs. And here I, I can pa I can see that I pass the test. So uh, like I know that like this function is performing as I expected. So now uh, similarly than before I can convert it to very long. And here you can see it's funny because in Verilog it also maps that to an high level primitive. So it says like implement a multiplier uh, of four bits by four bits. But then it will be up to synthesis to figure out how to actually implement this multiplier using gate. And so that's what I do next. Um, I perform the step up to synthesis. And then I can preview the actual multiplier. And here you see that uh, it's, uh, it's a lot more complicated than it was for the header. Like if you actually want to implement the multiplication, like there is a lot of things that you need to do. Mm -hmm. There are going to be a lot of gate uh, here, and that maybe doesn't come as a surprise for if you are already like familiar with hardware and how like CPU are implemented. But we run this workshop with a lot of um, computer science students, and they were really surprised by uh, that result. They didn't really expect uh, like uh, multiplication to be so complicated to implement using hardware. And so next, like we can um, write uh, like similarly the open link configuration for, uh, for our design. So here we have like 50 by 50 and still this 30% uh, um, uh, density that we want. And we can run the flow. And here you see that the flow is failing. Uh, because uh, we have a lot more gates than before to, to put together. So here, like, we have two solutions. Does someone have an idea of what we should do? Like, no? So, like, we have two uh, configurations that we can specify. Either the size of our die or either the density. So, like, those are the two parameters we can play here. We can either have, with here, that there is, we can either make the chip bigger or we can make it more dense. So because I don't want a bigger chip, um, because it takes uh, more time, <laughs> I'm going to uh, put like a, a bigger density. And so if I put 0, 07 here, and so I say that the, the gates are allowed to be a little bit more uh, uh, packed together, hopefully it should allow me to get a pass placement. So here it's going to be take a lot more, uh, a little bit more time because there is a there is a, a bit more to do uh, for the tool to actually wire all those gates. And like you can see here, the log is a little bit terse. Like you don't see a lot of information about what's going on. But uh, if you look at the, um, here inside the run directory, you actually have a, a full directory with all the logs for all the tool for each of the run that you do. So you can really dive down if you need to. And then I could like print the metric. And so here I see that the breakout of gate is a lot more um, here. Um, if I look at the gate, I have like 10 and gate, like uh, 13 or gate. I should also see that the wire length almost like multiply by, almost multiply by 10. But my chip is not that bigger because like I, I mentioned to pack more density inside of it. And finally, if we try to preview it, we can see here, um, and if I remove the top layer, we 
can see here, like all the gates that are laid together and all the connection like between them. So that, that's one example of like a more complicated design. It's not like the most complicated design, but it's a good like uh, give you like a good idea of of the range and how the tool can scale. So I'm going to go back to my presentation. How long? Uh, I think I still have five minutes left. So I may not have time to show like the full demo I wanted to show, but uh, I'm going to show you um, like this very quickly. So um, the idea is that now that we have like this notebook that we can run on one design, uh, we can define like some parameter for it. Maybe for example, like the density and the uh, area size that we were able to parameterize and a metric that we want to score this experiment against. So for, for example, we could say like we want the chips that yield the less power. And when we have like this kind of notion of input input that we want to correlate, there are services an open source tool called uh, uh, Vizier that allow you to do parameter turning on this. And here I have an example of me running this design on a RIS-5 chip, so a much more complicated design, and kind of uh, playing on those two parameters, like um, the diarrhea and the density, and trying to yield the design that consume the less power. And so here you can see like uh, 10,000 experiments I perform, and you can see like uh, slowly converging toward like this good ratio between uh, uh, area and density to achieve the least power. So the least power design are in uh, blue. You can see it's creating um, a lot of things all over the place at the beginning and slowly converging toward that line. And I'm sure that people, uh, for people that are uh, deep into the field of hardware engineering or silicon, like they know about those parameters, and they know how they correlate together. But for people that are new coming from software, uh, it could be really hard to kind of get the same uh, intuition. And the nice thing is that we can use the cloud and we can use like parameter tuning uh, to actually perform this operation for us and kind of produ produce experiment and us to kind of find the same result. And because we do that into notebook, we are also able to uh, produce like some nice visualization on, on what's actually going on. And um, I have a quick uh, demo of, of that that I can quickly show, which is like basically the parameter tuning uh, thing. Uh, so like there is um, this um, project I deployed on Google Cloud and I have like the self design with a notebook that's really looking really similar to the one I was uh, showing before. And here you can see instead of producing like uh, just a few gates, it produced like uh, thousands of them. And then I have like um, this other notebook that I use for tuning. I specify that I want uh, to tune the target density and the die width and that I want to minimize like power. And then I run a, a, a job and I specify that I want to uh, run like 500 jobs with batch of 20. So every 20 job, I will get some metrics for those 20 parameters. I will send them to the optimization system. It will me return to me like 20 new, uh, new parameters to try for. And with that, I will be slowly converging toward like a design that can meet uh, the metrics that I'm asking for, which is minimizing power. And so after I'm done uh, running those experiments, I can actually fetch like all the notebook that were generated by this experiment. So I have a view of all the experiments and all their parameters. I can visualize like each of them and kind of see which parameter got uh, selected, kind of get like, the full log from the design, including up to the layout at the end. And when things go don't go so well, I can see the exception and kind of troubleshoot what the given run uh, was not uh, successful. And here, like if you can see here, the density and the die width were really small, so it's likely not to fit. So it's likely to be one of those experiments here um, that didn't yield uh, uh, a successful design. And afterward, we can aggregate all those metrics that we have inside the notebook and can generate like a, uh, a, um, a, a aggregate in a table and know which of the design like consume the less power. So it's like the experiment 230, which add like those parameter. And we can also generate like a visualization on how they map to the parameter space. So here we can see like all the experiment that got um, a little similar to the thing I was showing before. And so that's the idea that you, dis you can design, like use notebook to design like experiment that goes end to end from like your code description to the actual chip. And then you can orchestrate those experiments and do parameter tuning to find the best parameter for your design. So um, the last thing I wanted to mention is that like, so Google is working on making those tools better. He's working on open sourcing those PDK. But we also uh, realize that it costs a lot of money to manufacture chip, and if people want to actually fabricate their chip, uh, they need to have a way to do so. So we run this open MPW shuttle program, and the rules are very simple. So you don't have to pay for anything. 
for manufacturing uh, your design, Google is going to pay for the mask and pay for the wafer. Um, the only condition for you to enroll inside program is that your design is open source. So as long as you are an open source design, you are eligible to for that program. And if you submit a, a, a design to that program, you could be uh, one of the 40 projects that are selected. We run one of those shuttles like once every two months. And the idea is that we try to reproduce design that are uh, reproducible using this open source tool chain. And at the end, you get like a board, a little boat like this, with a few chips for you to test. We run this shuttle like since two years now, and we've seen like really increased engagement. We've got like as, ma as many as 100 designs submitted to the last one. And like lastly, like if you want to know more about that program and know more about the open source tooling and know more about the notebooks that I mentioned, you can go to this website, developers.google.com slash silicon. And we also have like this blog post uh, that kind of sum up like all, um, the, the whole program. And there is this open source dash silicon dash, dash silicon dev, dev uh, community on Slack where there is more than 4,000 members that are kind of um, unrolling on the shuttle and talking, exchanging information about how to run the open source tool. So that's it for me. Thank you.